everyone, welcome to part two of um, our lecture for um, uh, Tuesday, November 10th, and I'm just realizing it says Wednesday on the uh, slide deck, but you know what I mean. Um, so I wanted to continue with our discussion of working with uh, supervised um, and unsupervised methods for data. In this um, lecture, what I'd like to do is talk about dimensionality reduction. Now this tends to happen with unsupervised um, uh, learning methods, particularly in preparation for um, applying uh, these types of learning methods. So what we're going to do today is focus on principal components analysis, and what I'm going to do is build that up. Um, it's a mathematical technique, so I'm going to introduce some mathematics. What I'd like you to get out of the lecture is an intuition for how principal components works and the ability to carry it out in R. So I'm not going to ask you, say, for example, of proof of the mathematical properties of um, principal components analysis, for example. However, the mathematics is important to understand the intuition behind um, what it's doing and why you might want to use it and how you actually apply it. A lot of mistakes have been made because people learn um, uh, sort of R commands or whatnot for principal components analysis and then apply it in ways which you just can't apply it. So principal components is a little bit tricky that way. And so I'd like you to bear with me through the mathematics as we um, build up our intuition for how principal components works and when it actually works or why it works. Okay. All right, so um, we've been thinking about high dimensional data in this class, for example, data with many more variables than observations. Uh, well, I'll go through and introduce some of this, and this is particularly one application where principal components can be very useful. I'll give an overview of uh, PCA. Um, we'll talk about the notion of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. This is one of the core insights that underlies principal components analysis, and then we'll do some uh, computation. And in fact, I have some examples in our actually at the end of this lecture. Um, okay, so there's a notion in statistics that is also in machine learning and um, in uh, sort of quantitative discussions, and it's called the curse of dimensionality. So we have an intuition, particularly when you start thinking about modeling data and uh, trying to extract information from data or uncover signal, that if we can take more measurements of what we're interested in, then we're going to do a better job uh, uh, understanding the under the, the true underlying reality. So, for example, I've used this this trivial example in class a few times about trying to find out the average height of students at University of Illinois, for example. And I could take the sample of everybody in the data science class, and right away everybody has an intuition that maybe that's not the best way to find out an average height to average the heights of the people in our class. Uh, the reason is it's not a random sample, for example, across the university. And so your intuition says, um, maybe I shouldn't be looking at such a small number of students given the very large number of students who are enrolled, and what I should do is get a bigger sample. So even if we put the randomness versus non-randomness issue aside, and I just got like measured the heights of more students, and you, would, you have an intuition that that's going to get um, an improved estimator of the average height of, say, undergraduates at University of Illinois. And... Uh, and so that's, that's actually a correct in intuition, and part of it lies on the fact that if I keep taking measurements of students, eventually I'll get to all the students, and that really will be the true underlying average of all the heights if I've measured everyone. Right? So we're getting kind of closer and closer to that truth. So the curse of dimensionality is not intuitive in that sense. And it actually goes against that intuition. So I'm going to give you some examples to, to help you kind of develop a little more of an intuition about when modeling gets difficult and when um, adding more data doesn't necessarily mean more accuracy in your estimation. Okay, so here's the, the cursive dimensionality definition. Um, I know I'm being recorded and you can just stop this and read it, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. Uh, there are multiple phenomena referred to by this name in domains like Numerical analysis, sampling, combinatorics, machine learning, data mining, databases, etc. Statistics is another one. The common theme of these problems is that when the dimensionality increases, so dimensionality in this case means how many more variables do you have, say, above observations, the volume of the space increases so fast that the available data becomes sparse. So, for example, what they mean by volume of the space 
is if I'm, let's go back to our example of measuring heights, that's essentially one dimension, right? I'm, measured, I'm just measuring heights. And so in a sense, we don't have the cursive dimensionality in that case, because what I'm doing is adding, if I'm adding more and more students to that database of measurements, we're really only traveling along that one dimension. I'm taking height measurements. But if I started doing things like, like maybe I wanted to explain height, so I started to gather more information about the student, like, um, I don't know, parents' heights. We had that discussion earlier in linear regression and more demographic information about the student. I don't know where they grew up, how much they've done of this activity in their life, or what were they eating when they grew up. I don't know. I'm just throwing out ideas and brainstorming, but you get the idea. So I start adding more and more of these dimensions to the problem or these dimensions to the data set. Now, every time I add a student to my height data set, I've taken a wide variety of measurements. And so now I'm not kind of traveling along that one dimension around heights. What I'm doing is actually sort of expanding along all these different axes. I've got, you know, what did you eat growing up axis? I've got height axis. Uh, maybe I've got dad's height, mom's height. Um, where were you born? I don't know. Like just different, different uh, measure. How many times did you go to the doctor when you were growing up? I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Um, but in any event, Forget my silly example, but um, but what we're doing is we're measuring along many many different dimensions for each observation in the data set. So each student in the data set. So that's what it means. The volume of the space increases. So we're increasing not just along the height dimension. We're increasing along many different dimensions going in different directions. So we're making a really big space as we add students. So the volume of the space increases so fast that the available data becomes sparse. So in a big space, we can't have as, it takes a lot more points to fill the space densely. This sparsity is problematic for any method that requires statistical significance. So if you want a meaningful um, model of those data across that very high dimensional space, you need a lot more data to support that model in high dimensional spaces as opposed to low dimensional spaces. So in order to obtain a statistically sound and reliable result, the amount of data needed to support the result often grows exponentially with the dimensionality. So if I have, say, those five or 10 measurements I'm taking of each student, including their height, um, I need many, many, many more students in my data set every time I increase the number of measurements because I'm trying to fill a bigger space. Like I need more data points to, to, to fill that space that's got you know, height on one dimension, what you ate growing up on another dimension, number of times seeing the doctor, dad's height, mom's height, siblings height, whatever it is. Um, and so we've got this kind of big space we're trying to fill, so I need a lot of points in there. And if I only was measuring height, I just don't need as many points to, to measure it. So that's the cursive dimensionality. So let's do some examples. Okay, so here's a one-dimensional example. And in this example, so we've got one dimension here going along x, did not really need to call it x1 since there's only one, so x. Um, and we've got these three green diamonds down here, we've got some blue squares hanging out, and then some red um, triangles. And so what we might want to do um, when we're modeling this is try and find these cut points here to separate our classes. Now we remember we talked about this last class. So uh, this, these lines here, that are already drawn on here seem like they're a pretty good divider if I had to divide along this one dimension somewhere to maximize the grouping by each class. So this seems, you know, pretty straightforward. Uh, there's, not real, there's not a cursive dimensionality problem going on here. You have a little bit, I mean, your predictor's not going to be perfect because these are kind of mixed up in different classes, but that's the best we can do given that's what our data looks like. So now we have our predictor. So let's go to two dimensions. So now we have x1 and x2. So we've got these two axes here. So instead of just say measuring height or something like that, I'm measuring more than one dimension. So these points are now living in two dimensional space. They're living in the plane. And so we've got these three green diamonds here. We've got the same blue square, two um, red triangles, and then the two blue squares and one red triangle here. And now we have to make these same cut points, but we're gonna be making them in two dimensions. So in the plot on the left, we actually end up with these nine squares on how to do prediction. Um, it's, it, so 
Maybe we can group these separately with this one out here. I'm not sure. So it's, um, you can see compared to say, let's look at the previous slide quickly. These are pretty packed together. These are also kind of packed together here. And now they're the same number of points is of course more spread out over two dimensions, right? So in order to get the same level of kind of packedness or whatever you want to call it, data density that we had in one dimension, we need a lot more data to cover the space. So here would be an example on the right where you have uh, more data, more densely filling that space. So you see a lot more green triangles and so on. You see this blue squares kind of hanging out on the right and the red triangles hanging out on this left thing here. And that seems to be a little more comfortable in sort of making these boundaries about where you're actually gonna do the prediction. So you need more data and we only went up by one dimension here and we need a lot more data. You can see here, 27 observations as opposed to what we had before where we had nine. And notice it's not going up. We doubled the dimension, but it's not doubling. We're, we're going up at a um, faster rate. Okay, in three dimensions, if you can, if you can squeeze your brain to, <laughs> to picture this cube here, that's what's going on with um, these dividing lines. Now you see these three green diamonds hanging out on this side of the cube. You see these blue squares sort of hanging out, um, sort of on the right, but kind of maybe they're underneath the red triangles that are hanging out here. So my instinct is kind of like I want to draw this uh, boundary around the red triangles and sort of pull together these green ones and maybe have the blue ones going underneath. But we're working in three dimensions and um, it's m even sparser data. So to get the same level of coverage or the same level of data density and the same comfort level um, in our predictions as we had with one dimension, we actually need, you can see here, 81 points instead of nine. And we only went up two dimensions now, and we're up to um, you know, 81 um, points. So that's the curse of dimensionality. You're doing, you're working, when you're working in these higher dimension spaces, you need a lot more data for the same predictive power. Okay, so data required for prediction grows like n to the d, where d is the number of dimensions. So we would have had n to the three. We actually had um, nine to the three here. Describing and storing the data becomes increasingly difficult. So it's not just trying to store these additional amounts of data, but we're challenged in summarizing the data when the dimensions, the, the dimensionality goes up. So here's what we wanna do. We still have the same goals. We want to summarize our data compactly. So for example, build a model that allows us to summarize the data. And another thing we can, another separate goal we, we can carry out, um, reducing our dimensions so that we can feed the data more easily into other data processing um, uh, methods. So for example, we may reduce the dimensionality, say we collapse from, it's mysterious, I haven't said how we're gonna do it, but if we can collapse from say three dimensions to one dimension, then I can apply this classifier and be more confident in the results, for example. Okay, so that's called beating the curse. And uh, that's what we're gonna talk about today. All right, so here's an example. So I don't know if any of you have played Dungeons and Dragons. Um, my dad gave me, I never played it really when I was a kid and my dad gave me a Dungeons and Dragons kit for my birthday one time, so I know like the tiniest little amount about it. But I really, it just never really, I don't, I don't, I think you have to have the friends and sort of the social community for that to take off, and I didn't have it. But anyway, this gives an example of uh, cursive dimensionality. All right, so most of you know that um, in Dungeons and Dragons you create characters, and the characters have certain attributes. And they could be, like, there's a whole list of them, and here are some. So you have, um, certain amount of strength, certain amount of dexterity, certain amount of constitution, intelligence, wisdom, charisma, and so on. And so, um, and so that, it makes sort of these, it's like people, you know, make sort of unique um, uh, mixtures of these could define a, a, a certain character. Okay, and each of these um, attributes, say strength, is, um, can take a value one to 20. So, so that's when you're creating your character. If he's really strong, he'll be close to 20 or she and really weak, you'll um, end up with a lower number. So that gives us 20 to the six in this case, uh, for these six um, characteristics. And uh, that actually gives you 64 million different characters by varying these in um, uh, from one to 20. All right. 
So here's some examples. Character A, Amanda, strength is 18, dexterity 14, and so on you see she's got different values. Um, next character, Bert, strength is 18, dexterity 18, and so on, uh, charisma 9. And so the question is, in, if you think of this, if, instead of thinking about it as a game in Dungeons & Dragons, you think about this as um, uh, a point in a very high dimensional space. So in this case, we have these six attributes, each one taking one of 20 values. And so we're, we can think of Amanda as a point in that space with these six coordinates here, and Bert as another point with these six um, um, coordinates. So would I expect to see both or either of these characters? Uh, well, let's take a look at the probability, 64 million, so the answer is no. <laughs> you wouldn't expect to see them. You would expect to see that you, you, there's, they could come up, but it, there's just this huge range of um, characters you could actually have. Okay, so there's sort of standard ways to describe characters in Dungeons and Dragons, Mage, Fighter, Rogue, Cleric, and so on, and different um, um, subtypes. And so that brings the um, space in which you could have characters down to about 10,000 as opposed to 64 million. And so these classes have given a way to um, summarize the data so you don't actually have, have to have such high dimensional data. So that's one technique we have talked about a little bit in class is uh, clustering. So we can actually use clustering to summarize large data sets. And so that is a way of helping um, uh, understand um, the signal that exists in very large high dimensional data sets and step around the curse of dimensionality. We aren't able to actually, well, we, depending on some methods, we might be able to, but generally speaking, taking that, those clusters isn't an effective input into other methods. So what we're going to do is talk about how we could pre-process data, say the 64 million, and um, have that be basically turned into a, a lower dimension, but useful input into other statistical methods. Okay, so what we'd like to do is, um, uh, in this example, is describe student performance, compare students. So this is a, this is a problem that I have in every class. Um, hopefully you've never encountered this problem, but, but it makes a useful example. So in, in a class that is not this one, uh, students could have handed in five homeworks, and they may have written a midterm and a final. So the idea is, is there a way to summarize the data? So I've got five homework scores, I've got a midterm score, and I've got a final score for all the students, and summarize the data that makes it useful for comparisons. So for truly high dimensional data, so there are seven items on which the students were scored. If they are not highly correlated, that means the data themselves represent points all over the interior of that high dimensional space. So um, if that's the case, then what I'm going to need to do is use all seven measurements for each student, the five homeworks and um, the two exams, uh, in order to actually summarize the data and do the comparison. So there's not a lot of um, reduction in the size of the space that I can do if the performance on the homeworks and the midterms, and the, the different scores, are not correlated, for example. And then it ends up being more, basically I have the same challenge in comparing students and doing dimensionality reduction is not going to be as effective. Um, as you know, normally we don't see that in a class. Um, it tends to be the case that your homework scores are highly correlated, they're highly correlated with the exams and so on. Um, for whatever reason, that just is how it generally goes. Don't let that... Um, there's always exceptions, though. <laughs> you know, sometimes you get students who just um, really work hard and, and um, do much better, and so on. So, but generally speaking, um, you tend do tend to see correlations between the homework scores and the um, other scores in the class. So that means there's an opportunity for dimensionality reduction. So, for example, if I could represent, um, so if say homework one and homework two students got basically the same score on both of them. I could either combine them or uh, throw one out, for example, because um, uh, if the scores on homework one and homework two are pretty much the same, homework two is not adding extra information. So I could do that to reduce dimensions. 
Uh, personally, as a professor, I wouldn't do that. I would, of course, stick to the grading um, rubric I laid out in the syllabus. But let's think in sta as statisticians for a moment. If, if, there, if you, one of your scores is not adding extra information or one of those variables, we could reduce the dimensionality. Okay. Um, all right, so... Okay, so I, I, I'm not going to jump out and do the R example um, here, but for example, um, uh, this dimensionality approach is uh, what we're going to stick to for the, for the next little while in the next discussion, um, including some R examples coming up. Okay, so let's just move past that. Okay, so here's some data in D dimension. So this is the same little D that I was using earlier. And uh, we're just, we can represent this, say, as a vector. So this might be something like um, uh, the student data set I, I was talking about building with heights and um, parents' heights and so on and this other information. So this might be, for example, um, all those dimensions that would be associated with, um, with that particular data set. Now there's um, a number of different names that people refer to. This, this type of approach or this type of thinking exists in different fields and in different subdisciplines, and you'll run into different names for these variables, and it's all totally fine. So um, xj, so one of these x's from our big x vector, bold x vector here, could be called a covariate. So that would mean something like an explanatory variable or something that varies with the variable that you're trying to predict. It co-varies. Um, they are sometimes called features. So, for example, if I'm trying to predict student heights, features might be um, mom's height, dad height, nutrition, and so on. Um, they also are called input variables or independent variables. Okay, so we're going to make a couple of assumptions that they're not that tough, although they do exclude some data. Um, let's make an assumption that we have continuous value data. So, for, for example, something like um, uh, like age or something in bins, like a uh, categorical variable. We're not going to take male-female into account, for example, here in this, uh, in this particular example for PCA. And let's assume we have um, a, lot, a large number of dimensions, 10 or 100 or more. So uh, my small example with student heights, we'd have to <laughs> augment it with a lot more variables to sort of be in that same group. Okay. All right, so we can think of um, this uh, matrix representation. So capital X is our matrix. Now think of each one of these rows as um, representing, say, a student, and each one of the columns with all the measurements that are being made about that student, including, for example, height, parents' height, whatever it is. And uh, so that's very much like what we've seen with a data frame, for example, in R, that kind of layout. And so you can imagine something like um, this is the first column of X transpose, the first, the second column of X transpose, and so on. Okay, so just from notation, bold meaning vector or matrix, um, plain type without the bold meaning scalar like a number, just like five or something. Okay, so what we'd like to think about is two types of um, approaches. The first one, uh, it's called feature selection. So the idea would be in very high dimensional space, in your original space, what you'd like to do is choose a subset of the features or the explanatory variables, covariates, as I just said, they've got a variety of names, choose a subset of the features and use them in your prediction. So here, what this math is saying is we've got feature one, feature two, da, 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 up to feature n, uh, d, I'm sorry. And what we're gonna do is instead of using those data, we're going to instead um, create this new matrix or new um, set of features, um, xi1, xi2, up to xik, where xik, um, this ik is less than d. So we're going to reduce the number of features. Um, one of the things to be careful of is typing n twice on <laughs> selection, so just ignore that, it's just meant to be selection. Now one of the things to be careful of is how you actually reduce the number of features or the number of covariates. Um, you want to think about what your prediction task actually is. And so, for example, if I'm trying to predict student heights, I might eliminate different variables than if I'm trying to predict 
another variable in the data set, say I was trying to predict your dad's height or something. I don't know why I would be doing that, but suppose I was. So you might do the dimensionality differently depending on what variable you're trying to predict or how you're trying to predict that variable, like what your actual methods are. So it's not an arbitrary decision to just reduce the number of features. It is context dependent. Um, the, the, other, the other approach is feature extraction. So we can create new features by combining existing features. So I sort of hinted around at this when we were talking about um, grades. If you had a similar score on homework one and homework two, maybe we could just combine them into one variable. So here we have our features, x1, x2, up to xd. And what we'd like to do is take them to a new space where we've got some function of x11, x12, up to x1d, all the way to through to some function, like the kth function, of xk1, xk2, and xkd. So what we're doing is we're applying some function. It's not specified what it is. In the example with the grades, I was saying we would sum them, for example. Maybe that's a bit um, naive to do something like that. But what we'll do is we'll combine these variables in some way through the function, in this case, f1. And for these um, xk1 to xkd, we'll combine them through the function x fk. And then we'll just give them a new name because this f stuff is too hard to drag around. So this f1 of um, our data, we'll just, be, we'll just call it y1. And this fk of our data, we'll just call that yk. And so what we've done is we've created a new set of variables that are combinations of the other features or the other variables that we had in the high dimensional data set. And here again, k is less than d. So what we're doing is reducing the space that the data live in so that we can actually do our analysis. So feature extra extraction um, is a pre-processing step, so we'll be pre-processing our data, and we don't need to know in that case what prediction methods that we're going to use or apply the data on after we do the extraction. What we need, we do need to know f, for example, so we're going to spend some time figuring out how to find f. Okay, so um, we're interested in linear feature extractions. What is written here with these f's, this is extremely general, it could be any function. Here we're going to re restrict our focus for the time being to um, linear functions. So this, these first two sort of um, uh, vectors here, this is just um, giving us, uh, this is exactly what was on the previous slide where we have x1 to xd mapping to y1 to yk. That's exactly here, x1 to xd mapping to y1 to yk. So they've gone through this f transformation. And we can write this out, if we know we've done linear feature extraction, we can just write this out as um, a transformation. So there's some w11 here, w12, they're going to be applied to x1, x2 in order to get y1. And what's going on here, these are called w for a reason, these are weights. So it's going to be w11 times x1, w12 times x2, and so on. Um, and uh, they'll be added together. So w11 times x1 plus w12 times x2 plus dot, 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 dot. So just, it literally, I'm not, like, uh, like just matrix multiplication is all that's going on here, well, with the vector. And so this will weight um, x1 in a certain way, weight x2 in a certain way, when we sum them up and then that's what gives us y1, and so that's what's going on with linear feature extraction. It's a weighted sum of our original data. And then we'll get y1 out of it, and so on. We can write this in matrix notation if you're interested. Um, our matrix of values here, which is actually just this vector, y, is equal to x, so that would be our data here, our x data, times our weights. So that's what's going on here. And there's a little bit of terminology building up towards PCA. Um, y1, well, yi1 to yik, so our output we call scores, and then these w's we call loadings or weights. So basically what we multiply the original data by are called the loadings, and then the result is called the scores. Okay, so here's an example. So let's take our homework one to homework five scores, midterm score and final score, and then we could actually weight them by um, certain amounts. And uh, usually professors do this by weighting them um, as described in the syllabus. It would be a really weird um, thing if that didn't happen. So let's say that this is what was described in the syllabus, that homework one 
would be um, multiplied by 0 0.067, homework two multiplied by 0 0.067, and then homework three, I guess this was a hard homework, um, that would be multiplied by 0.133, homework four multiplied by 0 0.067, homework five multiplied by 0 0.067, and then the midterm multiplied by 0.25, final multiplied by 0.35. So all that's going on there is they're saying um, final is worth 35% of your grade, midterm is worth 25% of your grade, and so on. So notice that these um, weights here, or these loadings, as we're calling them, must sum to one. So we need to have um, be able to sort of say how we're going to weight these. And if we, if we sum them, all of these have to actually sum up to one. So that's going to come up again later. But um, that's one of the rules. <laughs> we don't get around that one. They've all got to actually sum to one. You don't want some weird incoherence, like a random number <laughs> floating around. So those are all going to always have to sum to one. So here, student score average is the score. Assignment weights. These ones are the loadings. Okay. Um, student score average is that. That's what is score here. All right. Let's see if I can get to the next slide. Okay. So what we'd like to do is find a good set of loadings and scores for a general data set. So um, don't worry about grades and syllabus example, but generalize that and think about what loadings here would we pick to, that would make sense with the data set to do this dimensionality reduction. So that's what principal components is gonna do. What we do is, um, this sounds all very fancy, but we take unsupervised data. So we have unlabeled data and then what we're going to do is do something called the singular value decomposition. That's this guy. And we'll apply this singular value decomposition to the covariance matrix of the X data. So that's all the principal components is. I haven't explained to you yet what a singular value composition is. I'm assuming you know what a covariance matrix is. Um, uh, but we'll, And then what we're going to do is apply it to unsupervised data. Covariance matrix is basically... Um, transpose your x matrix and multiply it by x and you've got how these um, variables vary together or co-vary. Principal components, so we have a set of linearly uncorrelated variables and those are the loadings. We'll multiply the loadings with the original data to get the scores just like in the previous example. Okay, so here's an illustration. So let's go to sort of our canonical quote unquote stats example, where we have this sort of football shaped data. I've drawn a few of those on the board um, as the semester has gone on. Um, so here's our data set. We've got, um, uh, it, it's living in the right quadrant here, upper right quadrant. And it seems to have some upward linear trend in a classic data set. Okay, so this has two dimensions, uh, U1, U2. We can still do dimensionality reduction, and in fact, I'd like to do it in this case because I can draw it for you. It's like, I, like we said earlier, when the dimensionality is 10, 100, or more, that's when this becomes really um, important and has a big payoff. It doesn't have so much of a big payoff in two dimensions. However, I can show you what's going on, and the geometry is the same in high dimensions. I just can't draw it and show it to you. Okay, so now what we want to do with um, principal components is we've got, these are the same data here, and what we'd like to do is find a different set of orientations for the data that takes the variability of the data into account. So what principal components is going to do, roughly speaking, is um, look at the, the cloud of points that you've got. So in this case, we've got this in two dimensions, and then it will find the direction of greatest variability along your data. So this is where um, sort of the longest line is through the data. So that's where the data is varying most, right? And then principal components will say, okay, well, that's going to be direction one. And then what I'm going to do is go orthogonal to that direction, and I'll say that's direction two. And so what one way to think about principal components is your data. So, this, so notice the point cloud itself has not changed. All we're doing is we're drawing these lines on it. And what you can think about it as, okay, so this point cloud, it's living in this U1, U2 coordinate space. I'm just going to give it a new coordinate space. Actually, I'm just going to rotate this a little bit like that way and then just kind of move it over there. So that's what principal components is doing. And so far we haven't actually done dimensionality reduction, but we have learned something about our data. We've learned the direction in which it uh, varies maximally. And this is a little bit... Um, 
a little bit truncated because normally for principal components you'd have a very large number of dimensions. You wouldn't have two like this. But what we would what we would do to do dimensionality reduction is we would say, okay, so now that I know the direction of maximal variability, I know this orthogonal direction, which is actually the direction of second most variability. Um, I could, for example, just represent all these points as along v1 and just dump this v2 information altogether. Dump how far they are from v1, which is what v2 is measuring, and if they all just sat on v1, like this, this one just kind of sat down there, that one sort of sat up there, that one came down, came down, this one sat up there, those are the projections. So we used, we projected each point onto v1, then we could just have a one-dimensional representation of this data set. So have we lost information? Yes, we've lost information along v2. We've lost how far these points vary away from v1. But the argument of dimensionality reduction is that's just so small, who cares? And so we can reduce the dimension. Uh, you need to be very careful making those decisions, and at the end of the lecture I'll talk to you about how to make those decisions, but that's essentially what's going on. All right, so how do we find v1, v2? Um, they're, they're actually down here. So if we wait, so the notation's a little screwy here. If we call, so this would be, let's see, x2, x1, and this would be y1, y2 in the new dimension here. But what's going on down here is you can see the, the, the idea is that the original data, x1, x2, so these beigey, blushy colored red points, have been weighted by some weights that I haven't told you what they are, but W11, W12, and W21, and W22, these weights that allow us to determine this V1 and V2. So Y1, Y2 is what they are. Sorry that the letters are different. That's confusing. But you can see that this Y1 is this vector traced out in this direction, and Y2 is this vector traced out in this direction. And for the appropriate uh, w11, w1, w2, w12, sorry, you'll get this line here. So we just need to find out what w11, w12, w21, and w22 are to allow us to um, to draw these lines over the original data set that give us these new axes that follow the characteristics of the data set, for example, this maximal uh, direction of variability, and then the um, orthogonal um, axis here, giving us this new, it's called the new basis for the data, if you think of uh, just how we can measure the actual data here, or map it out. Sort of looks like another another set of axes, right? So that's the right, that's the right way to think about it. Okay, so here we have the linear transformation, and I was talking about how if you wanted, you could just dump one of the dimensions, and instead have all the points just sort of forget the extra information from the second dimension and all sit down on the first dimension. So that's what's happening in this illustration. So all these points have just forgotten, quote unquote, um, the uh, second dimension and they're all now sitting nestled together down on the um, V1, the axis of greatest variability for the original data set. So they've been projected down onto this dimension. Okay, so that's not the same data as we have. We've lost that information. However, it's an approximation for that data. And if you're going to have one dimension, it's actually one, um, uh, you, you're best off picking the dimension of greatest variability or greatest spread in the data here. So for PCA, what we're going to need to do is think about how to call the number of dimensions in a similar way. As I said before, you wouldn't normally take two dimensions and apply all this machinery to get it down to one dimension. But that's what's happening in the higher dimension. So you might take something like a thousand dimensions and bring it down to 10 or something like that. I just can't plot it for you. But all that, all that same stuff is going on here. How we will um, look at directions of maximal variability in the space and then project data down onto the lower dimensions. Okay, so the math here it's, um, this is what's going on. Like if, you, if we just grab one point, randomly one point in the data set, so we'll just call this one x, it can be mapped with coordinates x1, x2, or fully described with those coordinates. And so what we want is we want to project these points um, onto um, this new dimension or the new direction. Okay, so x1, x2 scalars, these are our coordinate points. 
we have these um, vectors u2, u1 that are our axes, and x is just a combination of x1 times u1, x2 times u2 gives us our, our point here. Okay, so um, now we want to um, take our vector, whoops, I'm sorry, take our vector v here, and we're going to project these points, like x, for example, the purple x gets projected onto v, our vector in the direction of maximal variability of the data, and the point, this is a new point, this green one, called x prime, at least in this example called x prime. And so we just essentially just move these points down onto or up onto this v vector of maximal, um, the direction of maximal variability. Okay, so we have a new direction vector v. Um, w1 is going to be the linear transformation of u1 and u2 onto v. So that's mathematically what's written here. So we're creating v as a weighted sum of u1 and u2, the weights w11 and w12. And then we project x onto this vector v to make x prime. x prime will always sit on this vector. That's the definition of a projection. And x prime is going to be equal to y times w1. All right, so that's how we're doing our projection here and getting this purple dot up there to be the green dot. And what the result is, we have these two coordinates, x1 and x2, that get turned into one coordinate because we just have this one line that all the data are going to live on now because that's what's happening with the projection. Okay, so I've been talking about w11, w12, or here, w1, um, and I just mentioned them like as if it was obvious, but we actually do need to go through some work to come up with what w1, well, what, what these weights should be when um, we'd like to have identify v or that direction of maximal variability. You could just put any old numbers in for your weights. You just won't get a particularly uh, efficient result because we want the direction of maximal variability because we're trying to find the direction with the most information. That's the direction we want to preserve. So all that variability is all the information in the data. Um, okay, so closeness is based on squared error between the original points and the new points. We've seen that before. We saw that in linear regression, for example. And we're going to use Euclidean distance. If you remember a couple of classes ago, we talked about different norms, i.e. measurements of distance that we could use. People use different ones. Uh, most of the time, Euclidean distance is used, but um, not always. In this case, uh, we'll use Euclidean distance. So just to remind you of the definition, it's taking um, one point minus another point here. So this actually, I think this should probably be x prime because I'm interested in how far x is from x prime. Square that distance and sum all the distances up and take the square root is generally how you would calculate Euclidean distance between two points. It shouldn't really be the same point here. It should be two points, it should just be a bunch of zeros. Um, but that's how you do it between two different points. So you can see here xi and xi prime. It should have been xi and xi prime in there. So I'm sorry about that. Okay, so we measure um, distance as Euclidean, distance squared. Um, in that same as we saw with the linear regression case, it means big differences here because of the squared term get amplified because of that squaring. Um, small deviations are less amplified. So what we'd like to do, just as in the linear regression case, is we want to minimize squared errors. So the, math, the mathematical way that you write that out is we're going to find the series of weights, here, W1, that minimizes how far x is from the projected value squared. That's all this is saying. So basically, can we get sort of quote unquote as close to the data as we can when close is defined as how far each point is from that, say that line V, um, by squared Euclidean distance. Okay, so now remember how in the example with the grades and the homeworks and the two exams, I said that the weights would always have to sum to one for it to have a, any kind of coherence. So that's all this is saying. So these 
two lines here. We saw, we've seen these actually in class. They represent norm. Um, so here the norm of this vector w1, norm squared is what that little 2 is doing here. That norm is just going to say take each entry in that vector of weights and square it. So we're going to square the first entry in W1, the second entry in W1, square the third entry, and then sum all those squared entries. So that's all this is saying, and we're going to say that has to be equal to 1. So the ge another geometric way of thinking about it is one step in the old coordinates, so that U1 and U2 we had in that picture, is equal to one step in the new coordinates V. So when we did that rotation and put that new set of axes over the data, we didn't do something like squish it smaller or distort it or change the scale in any way. We had actually the same scale, so the data are represented the same way. So this little 2 down here, L2 norm, just as a little tidbit of information. Okay, so um, I'm going to introduce some mathematics uh, over the next two slides. Uh, this is really to familiarize yourself with how people um, talk about PCA and it gives a little bit of insight into why PCA works. Okay, so just bear with me through this. So we're just going to go through this minimization exercise uh, to find W1 hat. So we said before we are going to find the minimum of these distances of the projected values to the actual values using the Euclidean norm, sum all of them up, subject to the constraint that W1 when I take every term in W1 and square it and sum them all, that has to be equal to 1. So they sum to 1 in some loose sense. So we know x prime is the projection and can be replaced by y i w 1 j here, the same projected value. So we're just going to do that substitution. Then we're going to write it in matrix notation. So y is also equal to x transpose w1 here. So we'll just actually write that out using the matrix notation. We can continue, do some more um, matrix manipulation, and then we actually get this, um, this formula, which to some degree you'll have to trust me on a little bit. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to find the maximum here of the weights transpose, so w1 transpose times x transpose x, so now we see this covariance information, I don't know why it's not letting me highlight, there we go, the covariance um, information appearing, so these weights are around the covariance matrix, and you could write this, you know, if you really wanted to, you can write it in this form, w1 transpose times 1 over n x transpose x times w1 normalized by w1 transpose times w1. So this is, the reason I'm writing it out this way is this has a special name and a special um, theorem associated with it that, that is helpful for um, uh, PCA to work. Okay, so this piece, um, 1 over n x transpose x, you can also write it out this way without using the matrix notation, that happens to be what we call the maximum likelihood estimate of the covariance function, the covariance matrix. So we haven't discussed maximum likelihood much in class, so don't worry too much about it. What it is saying is that's one way of estimating the covariance matrix. So we have our high dimensional data x, and this gives us an estimate for the covariance matrix, which is great. Okay, and then that, that um, this equation, well, this sort of um, chunk that we saw on the previous page is called the Rayleigh coefficient. So now we can pull together two facts. 1 over n x transpose x is symmetric. We know the covariance matrix is symmetric. And the Rayleigh coefficient value is equal to the largest eigenvalue of 1 over x x, tri x transpose x. Um, I haven't explained what that eigenvalue means. You have to hold on for just a moment. but. Um, it has something to do with PCA, so we're, 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 we're going to get there really soon. And then um, the other fun fact from 1 over n x transpose x, or just x transpose x being symmetric, is that w1, the value of w1 that maximizes this Rayleigh coefficient is going to be the eigenvector associated with the I largest eigenvalue. Okay, so that probably doesn't mean much. If you've seen these and you have a sense of eigenvalues and eigenvectors from linear algebra, it, it, this may be making sense, but I'm going to um, go ahead and explain what these mean. But that's some of the mathematics, um, some of the logic that underlies 
uh, principal components analysis. Okay, so then I said after we got our first feature, so remember we used W1 to calculate V1, we wanted to um, uh, find the next greatest direction of uh, variance. So the way to do this is we'll recenter the data by subtracting off this projection x1 from x. So that's literally done with um, subtraction here. So our new data, x1 tilde, is going to equal our original data minus this projection x times w1 times w1 transpose. And remember, that's just our projection. So we're basically getting rid of, um, we've already kind of taken that direction of maximal variance into account. So now we want to kind of get rid of it and find the direct next direction of maximal variance. So we go through and we do the same thing and we minimize um, uh, min squared error and so on with the, this new subtracted off data set and we keep continuing until we actually chunk through all the dimensions of the data set itself. So in, our, in the example I was drawing, it's like two <laughs> dimensions, but usually you have more. Okay, so um, thinking about principal components analysis geometrically, we want to minimize these squared errors, how far the projections are um, from how, how, how far the projections are from the original data. So we want our line to be quote unquote close to the original data uh, in, in the way that we've described in lecture, close through Euclidean distance. And so that, that's all this is saying here. So our um, algorithm is, first of all, we center the data. And then we'll actually, instead of having a, um, a line, people tend to fit what's called a Gaussian distribution to the data. So you see this ellipse here? And um, they tend to fit this ellipse to the data. Now, the, because we've centered the data, the data are hanging out with their center at zero by definition. So we say the center of the ellipse is zero. Same thing as saying it has mean zero. And it has the same covariance as the data, sigma. Unfortunately, covariance is represented as sigma, and so are these sums. So don't get them confused. It's, um, there's no, uh, like, we didn't write i equals 1 to n or anything like this on the, on the um, sigma to mean covariance. So you can tell them apart that way, for example. So W1, our weights, is going to, those are going to give the direction of the covariance ellipse with maximal variance. So notice how it's kind of going the same as V1 here. Okay, and by the way, you're not going to do this by hand. We're just going to call <laughs> our commands to do it, but I'd like you to know what's going on. Okay, so then we can generalize to multiple dimensions. So suppose we have D original dimensions, and what we would like to do is reduce D down to K, just like in our previous example, so we only have K dimensions to work with in the data set. So our vectors now um, have the same direction as the K ellipse directions with maximal variance. So all this is saying is we have V1, direction of maximal variance, orthogonal, we have V2, um, uh, second direction of maximal variance. That's all I can show you in the two dimensions in the plot here. Uh, but you can imagine in higher dimensions, we just sort of continue the same way. So the third dimension, third highest um, variance, fourth direction of fourth highest variance, and so on. Okay, so here's the algorithm. How do we actually find this? It's very important when you carry out C PCA that the data are centered at zero. Um, forgetting to do that, you just can't apply PCA, and there are some really dramatic mistakes that have been made um, that even got published in the literature in very sensitive areas uh, where people did not center their data and they carried out PCA and of course they got a bunch of um, uh, incoherent junk at the end of it. I mean it wasn't obvious that it was incoherent junk but if you looked at the methods you knew that what they were doing wasn't right. So incredibly important center everything to have mean zero. In general this is a good idea in stats and in data science just in general. It's not always necessary. In PCA, it's absolutely necessary. We saw that ellipse centered at zero. You have to have your data centered at mean zero. Everything gets all mixed up otherwise. Um, the scales won't, um, won't make sense. And because we're doing these rotational transformations, you need to have that centered at mean zero. Okay, we're going to fit this multivariate Gaussian distribution to the data. All that's saying is we're going to find those ellipses um, that go along the direction of maximal variance second most variance, third most variance, and so on through all your dimensions. Um, here's our estimate for the covariance matrix. This is the same as what we saw before, 1 over n x transpose x. 
written without the matrix notation here, 1 over n, where we sum um, i equals 1 to n for each element of xi and xi transpose. So that gives us a matrix. What we'll do is take that estimate of the covariance matrix and we'll find the mysterious eigenvalues and eigenvectors that I have not yet explained to you, that they keep coming up. Um, but we'll find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. And then our k most descriptive dimension, so the, the directions we're going to choose or the dimensions we're going to choose, are the eigenvectors associated with the k largest eigenvalues. So once we find these mysterious eigenvalues that are just scalars, and the eigenvectors are vectors from the covariance matrix here, we will order, they're, they're associated, so you'll have one eigenvalue associated with one eigenvector, and all we do is sort the eigenvalues and take the biggest eigenvalues and, and their associated eigenvectors, like the k biggest, and those are the dimensions we keep. That's all. I mean, that's what happens in PCA. So except for the fact that I haven't explained eigenvalues and eigenvectors yet, um, but that is a, a, just a command we're going to call in R, um, and I'll, I will go on to explain them, uh, but that, that's really all there is to PCA. So let's make that real. Okay, so... Um, so for eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we need a couple of pieces of um, uh, terminology. So if we take x, so here x would be a vector, x1, x2, da, 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 to xn, and we pre-multiply it, for example, by matrix A, so A times x, what we're doing is we're actually changing the values of x according to whatever numbers are inside A. So that's what's going on when we do our um, multiplication. And so that is, that is called the transformation of x through A or whatnot. And so these matrices actually describe transformations. So in special cases, you can actually preserve um, some elements of that transformation. So some parts of x will actually uh, be unaffected through that transformation. So you could end up with something like transformed values of x, so A times x, are actually equal to some lambda times x. Okay, you wouldn't necessarily expect that to happen, so here lambda is a scalar, um, but it can happen in some cases. So this sort of magical looking um, def well e equivalence here uh, allows me to define eigenvalue and eigenvector for you. So here on the right hand side, x, it's the same x on both. Um, x, when this is true, and it's not always true, but if this is actually true, x is going to be an eigenvector of a. So there, this is the same x. That's crucial to understand here. Same vector x. And the scalar that makes this true is eigenvalue of a. Okay, the eigenvalue is describing the magnitude of the change in x under a. So they have these um, interpretations. So that's all people mean by eigenvector and eigenvalue. Eigen, um, it sounds German, and it does in fact come from German. So um, when eigenvalues and eigenvectors were discovered, so people started to understand this relationship here and what it meant when it was true, um, they thought it was really, really important, like integrally important to understanding the matrix A. So eigen means own, so like, uh, so x being the eigenvector, it's like its own vector of A. It's so crucial to understanding or describing the matrix A. And lambda being the eigenvalue, that's, the, uh, that's A's own value, in a sense. So that's how important they thought um, lambda and x were when this holds true, the eigenvector and the eigenvalue. Okay, so I just sort of put that... Um, that equivalence there and said like ax equals lambda x and said when that's true we, we can interpret x and lambda as um, eigenvector and eigenvalue and that's correct uh, but how do you actually find lambda uh, when that to, to make that equation true ax equals lambda x so the way you do it is you find the, this um, the roots of this polynomial so um, a minus lambda times the identity matrix when it's zero, so take the determinant here, and, uh, and I have some examples if you want to try it out and see if you can by hand find um, eigenvectors, for example. I think it's a good idea to try it out. These are not, they're two by two and they've got pretty easy numbers in them, so it won't be too taxing, but it really, it's kind of, I remember when I was learning this, 
I just kind of thought, well, that seems kind of weird. Like, who cares? And what does it even mean for that to be true? And then when I actually went and did it, and it turned out that you could find cases where that actually was true, and the cases when you found it, lambda had a special meaning, and x had a special meaning. I mean, that was kind of cool. It's, so it's worth, um, it's, I think it's worth trying it out. And we can go over it in class too, if uh, just remind me on Tuesday. Okay, so we'll start with eigenvalue lambda i, solve this set of linear equations, ax equals lambda i times x, and then come up with the, with x will be the eigenvector associated with lambda i. And so this we can do with our examples too. Again, just worth going through. It's easy to check this in R. You can put these matrices into R and just um, uh, ask R to, to find the eigenvalue and eigenvector for you. So you can also just check that the stuff you're doing is correct too. Okay, let's go here. All right. Okay, so what does this have to do with principal components analysis? Well, I wanted you to understand the mathematical definition of eigenvalue and eigenvector. And uh, here's our steps for our algorithm. Number one, like I said, can't emphasize enough. You must center the data. First step in doing PCA. Second thing you do is compute the covariance according to 1 over n x transpose x. There are faster ways to do this than actually punching in the matrix multiplication in R, um, uh, but it's okay to do that too. Like if you're using R or MATLAB or, or whatever program you're using, um, you can do this, but usually there's a faster way to actually, like a cove function, for example. Um, compute the eigenvectors. You'd never do this by hand, but you'll use a function, well, except in the trivial examples I gave you, but for real data, you certainly would never try it. Um, you'll use the built-in functions um, in R. So get, eigenvalue, get eigenvectors. Eigenvalues will give you those, the loadings. Remember, we're going to sort them by the, and take the top k. And uh, so for the eigenvectors with the k largest eigenvalues, you can make factor scores according to this um, equation here. So we will multiply these w11, w12, da, 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 by x1, xi1, xi2, and so on to get our transform data up to k. Okay, that's all there is to PCA, and you'll never even have to um, uh, carry out these steps, except for the centering the data. Don't get lazy and just apply principal components functions to your data. Center the data, <laughs> that's very important. Um, but the rest you're going to actually just use functions for. However, it's important, it's really important to understand this intuition. Okay, so now when it says five, do computations in the smaller y space, that means whatever statistics or um, data science, uh, unsupervised learning that you may want to actually um, apply to your data, that's what that does. And then you may want to do six, transform your results back to the original space. So undo all that dimensionality reduction, put the results back into the high dimensional space so they can be interpreted perhaps. Um, Asking people to interpret data that has had eigenvalue and eigenvector transformations, um, it's hard. Uh, people don't really have an intuition for it. You may not be in a situation where you need to explain it to people though, but depending on the context, you may want to do that transformation into the original space. That's in six. Okay, so we can get eigenvalues, eigenvectors of x transpose x through what's called spectral decomposition. If you remember at the beginning of lecture, I mentioned the singular value decomposition of x, so that's what that's, what that's called. The singular value decomposition is another way of saying getting the eigenvalues and getting the um, eigenvectors. And um, I won't go into too many details, but you can actually just call singular value decomposition, grab eigenvalues and grab eigenvectors on your centered data instead of PCA. So that's just another way to do it. Singular value decomposition is um, a term that arises from linear algebra. It didn't arise from statistics. Okay, so here's what, another way to think about it. So this is the same stuff as we've seen. We have our data, um, our data matrix X. And what we're going to do, so X is N by P. We have N observations and P columns here. Often P is really big, so we want to bring that dimensionality down. We've been calling that D up until now, um, P. So what we're going to do is decompose our data matrix X into scores times loadings. Okay. So why do we go through all this work? Okay, but that, that's, that's all we're going to be able, that's all we're going to do if we do, if we think about this as a matrix factorization. There's no K here. I haven't done any dimensionality reduction. All I'm going to do is decompose X into our scores times our loading. So we're going to have weights and we're going to have scores here. And we can do this um, decomposition just 
based on what you've already seen so far in the class. It's not very exciting because we want to actually do dimensionality reduction. Okay, so let's look at that. So what we can do, um, say for feature extraction, what we've been talking about, we'll do the same decomposition, but instead of having it exactly equal to scores times loadings, we'll take a subset, like the, lo the scores and loadings associated with the k largest eigenvalues, and uh, instead we'll multiply n by k here, well, um, yeah, k, and then we'll multiply it by k by p. Okay, that works to get an n by p matrix. This is an n by p matrix here. So we're going to be able to reconstruct this. We'll do this decomposition, but we've only got k, k scores, k, k loadings, I guess, here. So it's only approximately equal here. We don't have the full, if we had n, um, n by p, p by n, then it would be exactly equal. Basically what I'm trying to say is if we had this, <laughs> it would be exactly equal. But because we don't have the full n and p, um, we, we're, we actually do have the full n, I think. What we're doing is reducing p. So we reduce p down to k here, and uh, we're doing our dimensionality reduction. This way it's only approximately equal. So it's like when we took those points and we projected them onto v1, and we lost that dimension in v2, so we lost that information. That's exactly all this is saying, if you remember that from earlier in the lecture. Okay, scores. So we can work in what we call the score space for low dimensional, um, which is low dimensional and approximately equivalent. We just have k dimensions instead of the original d or p dimensions, whatever we're calling it. And the loadings are, um, in a sense, building blocks for your data. So the loadings are giving you the weights and the scores are giving you the transformed um, data. Okay, so back to our old plot. So we have our, our direction of maximal variance V1, our um, orthogonal direction here V2. We're finding this rotation or linear transformation. We can call it now after going through all of that. The best describes the data. Okay, whoops. Okay. Yeah. Um, we throw out our less in, our um, lower dimensions. So we throw out our less informative direction. So in this case, with the two directions, we're going to throw out v2, and so all the points get collapsed onto v1. So in this case, p, or d, was 2, and k is 1 in this case. It's, like I said, it's a little bit of a trivial example, but, but I can plot it for you. Okay, so x1 and x2 are scalars. We have our axis vectors, u1, u2, and then um, again, we'll use these x1, x2 as weights on u2 to map these points. And then, as before, this is just reviewing as from before, we have x that gets projected um, as x prime onto our direction of maximal variation there, y. And we have this measure of closeness, how close um, the points are to v. So that's how we're choosing v. So v is described by our weights w. And we use this um, minimization criteria here. So we get this distance of the old points, our regular data points that we started with, x, i, j, and we want to get x prime, i, j, so the projection onto the direction of maximal variance in this case, as close as possible. So we want to pick that, it's going to be the direction of maximal variance, it's how, that's how um, this is going to work out. And don't forget we had that um, constraint that um, our uh, weights squared had to sum to 1. Square root of our weights squared sum had to sum to 1. Okay, so um, a little bit on centering the data. You can see here we've centered the data correctly and here we have not. It's really, really important to center the data even if your um, eigenvalues come out similarly because uh, as I said, we have that rotation that we're actually going through with the data and you don't want to do things like um, have scale differences, for example. Um, we need to, you, uh, we, we, you'd absolutely need to center the data before. Okay, let's, um, Center the data, compute the covariance matrix, compute the eigenvectors associated with that covariance matrix and their eigenvalues. The eigenvectors are our weights, w1, w2, up to wd, and then we choose a top k, as we, as we saw. Um, okay. All right, so the last thing that I wanted to mention was how to um, uh, choose the number of dimensions to reduce your data set to. And 
it, there's no kind of magical formula that's going to tell you how to do this in every case. It's a little bit artistic. So what you want to do is, so many, many people take this approach where what they do is they just look at the size of the eigenvalues. Now remember I said that what you want to do is sort the eigenvalues from largest to smallest and take the k largest. And so people will say, okay, so I'll just take the ones that seem to be contributing information to uh, my data set, and as soon as it kind of looks like they aren't contributing a lot more information, I'll just stop taking them and, and cut off k right there. And so that's what's happening in this plot. So this plot is called a scree plot, and it's a plot of the eigenvalues. So the first eigenvalue, well, these are variances. I would prefer to see this normalized as a, as a percentage, but in any event, you'll, they're definitely in um, sorted order here by size. And so this one, you can see it's, a, it's much more explanatory of the variance in the original data than any of the other ones. You have to drop down a lot in terms of information contribution to get to this next one. And you drop down a little bit more to get to the third. And then there's another big steep drop to get to the fourth. So it looks to me here like you would probably, in this data set, you'd want to make K3 and cut right here. You could even make it one and just cut here. And you can actually see how much information you're losing uh, by making these cuts and not taking the full, um, the full number of um, eigenvalues. So if, this, if we had a scree plot like this for the two-dimensional data, you could see that this eigenvalue would, would go with um, the direction of maximal variance and how much that direction explained of the data. And then if we cut it at 1, which is what we've been doing, and remember we projected all those points onto that v1, this second eigenvalue, which would be the only other eigenvalue in that case, that would tell us how much information we're losing um, when we do that projection, so when we actually reduce the dimension of that data set. So that direction this represents um, that second direction and that, that variability in the data set, so that would be gone when we reduce the dimension. So, so these eigenvalues actually tell us how much of the variability we're slicing off when we lose each of those dimensions. So here, presumably, we're losing very little dimension, uh, li I'm sorry, very little information or little variability in the data set when we get rid of that last eigenvalue. Same with this one, they look like they're all kind of sitting on zero, although this, this looks like it bumped up a little bit there. So maybe it's a little more than zero, so we're adding a little more information back. And then here we start adding more substantial amounts of information with these eigenvalues. And here we add a lot more information to the data set. And of course, as we saw a few slides ago, with that exact matrix decomposition, if we keep all these factors in, we, can, we keep all the variability of the data in, we haven't lost anything, we have also have not done any um, uh, matrix um, dimensionality reduction at all. So. Okay, so we're looking for this natural breakpoint here. So it may, in this case, it may be here. It may be here. Okay, ninety-five percent, ninety-nine percent of the variance explained. So probably you could dump all of these ones out here and still explain ninety-five percent of the variance. Maybe even ninety-nine. I can't tell just by looking, but um, but usually the way the eigenvalues are project are are presented in a scree plot is um, by proportion. So you would see this kind of sum up to one here for all the different, for all the eigenvalues. So you can see exactly what proportion of variance each eigenvector explained. Okay, so last part of the class, so we're just going to go through some R. Um, so R has PrintComp in the stats package uh, that you can use. So there's um, actually a really cool website, this astrostatistics.psu.edu here in the link. And um, I uh, took some of their examples here, like this marks.dat data is on um, that website. You can grab it, and I highly encourage you to go ahead and try this out, particularly plotting the data here and how you would call printcomp. So dat, we're just, um, uh, just grabbing the data that was read in with the read dot table. And here what we're saying is we're going to model stat and physics and take a look at what um, the, the printcomp output of the loadings is plot PC, for example, and you can go ahead and do a scree plot, which is uh, what we just had on this previous slide for the eigenvalues, and look for those breakpoints or those elbows, and that's where you're going to put K. It sounds very artistic.
<laughs> that's all it is actually there's no uh, hard and fast rules about it and there's no sort of mathematical way of determining what k should be okay so here's another example some quasar data that again I encourage you to try out particularly since we're going into higher dimensions so in this case we have 22 dimensions again we go through read dot table you can look at some of the um, characteristics of the quasar data um, omit the missing variables do print comp um, on all the um, rows, take off the first column, and then save the scores. So that's exactly the same way we've been using scores in this lecture. Take a look at that output data set, plot it, do the scree plot, um, use lines to do the scree plot. I think it improves it, see what you think. Um, take a look at the loadings, and uh, we can do something here. So if we have the first two, like the first two columns here for the loadings, transpose of M matrix multiplication times M, we should get the identity matrix back. So try that out and also make sure you understand why that should happen when we do that. And remember we're working with in loadings here. So this is a good test for whether you're understanding the, um, the idea of the loadings and how we actually got them. Okay, but you, and you can go ahead and, and do that plot too. Um, Okay, another example. So this, this, these data I loaded into Moodle, so you can just go ahead and grab them and try this out daily, 1995.csv. Um, we can calculate means across all the um, um, observations. I'm sorry, all the variables. We can um, center the data, very important. Center equals true, scale equals false, that's fine. And then take a look at these um, average daily temperatures here. Now remember, they're looking pretty cold, but we centered <laughs> those data. Oh no, this is before we centered. Okay, so they're just looking pretty cold <laughs> for whatever they are. Okay. Okay, so there's our points where our observation um, centers were. So we've got data um, there. And that's what some of the data looks like. And you can see this fluctuation around summer. So you get in more... Um, uh, higher temperatures in the summer, obviously, for the different places, Sacramento, um, in San Francisco, Fresno, LA, San Diego, Yuma, and then Flagstaff, Phoenix, and Tucson. So the question is, these there looks to be some similar structure in all these time series. They seem to, they basically all um, have these humps in the middle. This one's a little flat, but there's a little hump in the middle there. So remember what I was saying about how students' test scores were correlated, and if they're correlated, that allows us to do the dimensionality reduction. If they're not, and your score as a student on each homework and on the tests is all independent, and I don't get any extra information about how you're going to do on the tests, for example, based on your homework scores, then we're not really going to be able to do any effective um, dimensionality reduction. But here it looks like we could maybe do some dimensionality reduction. It looks like there's some similarities here and some correlations, so we can probably drop the dimensionality down a bit. Okay, so here's PrintComp, and um, I'll leave you to go through the R. It's really similar to what we've done, but go ahead and try it. You'll end up with PrintComp giving you an error at the end, probably, and um, it prefers more units than variables, i.e. more observations than variables. And so I wanted you to also be aware that PR comp exists in R to um, uh, get around this problem. It's got a different instantiation. It does do the singular value decomposition that we haven't talked about in detail in the class, but I've mentioned a few times. And it, it, it's able to actually carry out that, that type of analysis. Okay, print comp, I mean, I'm sorry, PR comp. Uh, we can go ahead and try PR comp. So here's some um, code to help you. Please go ahead and run the code. You can see, again, we're calling for a plot, looking at the scree plot, too, for um, eigenvalues. So hopefully you see those elbows and where you could cut off and do dimensionality reduction. If you have a dramatic elbow here, we're looking like we can probably reduce some dimensions here. Should be a good thing, and it wouldn't be surprising because we looked at that Paris plot and uh, we saw a similar structure across many of the cities. Okay, so principal components analysis is um, a nice way to do dimensionality reduction, for usually for pre-processing so that other techniques can be applied. Uh, one of the more famous um, applications of principal components analysis was to image data. So it says here, what if you have image data, can I use PCA? Of course you can. <laughs> so um, what you do is represent the image. So these are all black and white. 
So each point on the image is just going to be a value from 0 to 255 determining how much black should be represented. So what's the grayscale of each point? So, uh, so that's straightforward. So these are actually just matrices of numbers ranging from 0 to 255. And so you would make each of these images into a vector. And then, uh, then you have a series of vectors. And you can see that there's similarities, right? So these people don't all look the same. But compared to like, you know, a picture of a landscape or something, they look the same. So they've got kind of eyes, <laughs> you know, and stuff like that, you know, or sort of roundish head shape. Um, so we should be able to use PCA to do some dimensionality reduction here. And actually, it works reasonably well. There have been lots and lots of refinements on this in the research over the years. But, um, but if you're interested in this, it's called eigenfaces. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a nice application of, of PCA. Um, so I wanted to leave you there, and I also wanted to mention that I have uploaded to Moodle a few more pieces of um, background on principal components analysis. Uh, it's one of my favorite techniques in statistics because it has this nice geometric interpretation. It's really useful for dimensionality reduction. Um, the idea of picking out um, directions of largest variation in your data to me is a nice intuitive way to focus on the important parts of your data. So it's just, I think there's an intuition behind PCA that's lovely. It's really useful. Uh, people have used it everywhere. So I personally think it's a, it's a really fun technique uh, worth spending the time learning the intuition behind it. So that's why I put the extra materials on Moodle for you to take a look at. Um, so feel free to dig in and I'll be in class again on Tuesday. So um, please come ready with questions and we'll go through if you want to go through some of the examples in PCA. And of course I have um, office hours after class or um, if you can't make it then we can set up a different time. It's no problem and we'll go through some of this. So I will see you um, on Tuesday. And so here's our, here's our PCA summary. Um, variance oriented mapping of the original data into a smaller, smaller space. Um, we're using that um, Euclidean squared distance metric. So that makes it sensitive to outliers. It's a linear technique. So if the, if the true mapping should not be linear, PCA is not going to find it. If you don't have a lot of structure, meaning you have not a lot of correlations between your um, variables, uh, you're probably not going to reduce your dimensions very much. And uh, for high dimensional data, it's a very nice and intuitive way to, to work with a smaller dimension data set. Okay, that's it. And I will um, see you Tuesday. <laughs>